First of all, this is the Breeze from M Squared. Now this company makes a two-seater and a single-seater, and they make SLSAs. This may look like an ultralight to you, and this particular one is experimental, but these can be SLSA, meaning fully manufactured. It can be ELSA, meaning the factory can offer it as a kit that anybody can build for you and that may not have to take 51%, or you can build them in as an amateur build, which is what uh, Captain Anderson did here with this. And this airplane has got even more than the usual stuff on it. We're going to go through it. And this is uh, about a 40 some thousand dollar airplane, which as ultralights go sounds ridiculously expensive, but there's some very solid explanations for that. You'll see in a minute. But the main one of which is it, this has an 80 horsepower turbocharged two cylinder four stroke engine on it that I happen to love. It's a brand called HKS. We're going to look at that when we get behind the airplane. But let's look at the front part here first because there's just all kinds of things to look at. First of all, I want you to observe all this is, you notice up in here in the welding here, this is all, this is a lot, not all, not every bit of it, but a lot of it is stainless steel. I mean, this thing will work pretty well in a more difficult environment. It's not going to have the same rust issues that some other airplanes are. Of course, a lot of aluminum on it. You can't make a whole airplane out of stainless, but the main cage that surrounds the pilot here that provides a tremendous amount of protection for the pilot it goes all the way around you, and there's a double angle of it back here, too. You are really well protected. If you manage to hit the ground in this thing, which frankly I can't understand how you would do, this is one of the easiest flying airplanes uh, in the world. Uh, there's maybe a few others that are close or even similar, but this is really simple to fly. And I'm told in this airplane with 80 horsepower working for it, you notice it's only a single seat. He says an airplane and a half. Now from here to the back, I'm guessing is oh, a little over 20 feet maybe. So. At just another 10 feet out here with the throttle opened up from back there to here, you're, you're pulling back and you're going up. And the HKS engine is known for its ability to just sort of, as you go up, the engine doesn't work, it doesn't appear to be working any harder. Of course it is, I guess, but it just continues right on up with a steady RPM and a little lower RPM than the Rotax has. But let's talk about the engine here in a minute. First of all, let's look at some other things that I think are interesting about this airplane. And uh, Let's see, from your side over here, actually you're going to have to come around to this side with the camera, and I'm going to go behind the wing here. All, uh, all fared uh, uh, struts, by the way, including fared uh, jury struts. Of course, you don't need this one fared because that's going with the wind. Uh, and we'll look at the wing some more in a little bit, too. There's just so much to show on this airplane. There's a bunch of wires and stuff that go on back here, and a lot of these airplanes, you see all that stuff, and it looks a little untidy, so they put a little panel in front of it which is really nice, kind of makes it all just look a little neater and tidier. Uh, they have things like, uh, here's your fuel shutoff, and if you can see up here, I don't know if your camera will show just above my finger there, is a laser cut M squared logo built into that. Just a minor little thing, but all stainless steel here, fuel cut off. You have to come back and look at the back end of this panel a little bit, but you can tell it's an instrument panel because here's the pitot, and even that's fared on this. Not like this is a high-speed airplane. But this airplane, I'm told, and we'll look at the wing in a minute and see why, stalls at 19 miles an hour and will cruise at 65. That's quite a range and an impressive one at that. So uh, here's a very simple uh, throttle arrangement right down here with a nicely covered bungee cord. They all use a bungee cord as the method of trimming this airplane. So it tends to stay wherever you put it. I'm not going to move that very far because it's still hooked up to the engine. But that's part of that arrangement here. Uh, also a stainless steel oil cooler for the HKS and we're going to have to see some of the other stuff on top. Dual tanks on both sides. You can see the drain valve right here very easily accessed so you can check fuel uh, non-contamination and it's got a BRS parachute on it as well. So this has safety features beyond that which it really needs in some, in some way because it's such an easy flying airplane. Still in all you get in trouble once in a while. I love that it's got a BRS parachute on it. Now I want to come out in front of the wing here and show you the wing itself a little bit. If we look up here, uh, it's a local university near uh, M Squared. M Squared is in, is in southern uh, Alabama, and uh, they work with a local university, and they have installed these fixed slats up here, which if your camera looks in up here, you know, I can get my hand all the way back in here. That's just where the ear goes, of course. That makes that ear just hug the top of that wing very nicely. But in addition, they've also got VGs, and, and this is a fabric wing, by the way. This is called sailboat type fabric. Uh, there's some very high-tech versions of this. This is not just some childhood uh, Dacron covering or something. This is some very stout stuff, very strong and tough. And they glue these VG strips on. And it's got them all the way out to the end of the wing, 
and then come on out here with your camera and you'll see out here you've got some big end plates that prevent the air from looping around the top of the wing in that uh, way called wake tip vortices that sometimes causes, well, it could definitely causes some disturbance out of the end of the wing, makes the last part of the wing not particularly effective. As air from the higher pressure area goes around to the, uh, from the lower pressure area goes around to the higher pressure area on top of the wing. This keeps that from happening so much. Part of how this can airplane can stall at only 19 miles an hour. I could almost run 19 miles an hour, well, only in my dreams. But at any rate, that's not very fast. But now let's go look at the engine. That's kind of the real magic of this airplane. Biking aircraft. So now we're at the back. Again, we're looking at the, this is the breeze. Now there's also a breeze too. You're having to read it backwards there, but this is the breeze one, if you will, the single seater as we saw earlier. But this has the HKS engine on it. We know the HK, HKS engine for many years in this country, but we know it is a 60 horsepower. Two cylinder, you notice there's only one on this side, the other's horizontally opposed. So a two cylinder, four stroke engine used to produce 60 horsepower, and believe me, that'd probably still be more than enough for this airplane, but this one has two turbocharged units, units on it. One turbocharger for each cylinder. Now this gives it 80 horsepower, and here's an interesting thing about it. Where's the muffler? We don't see a muffler. There's the exhaust pipe right here, and this airplane, I forgot how many hours they said added on it, but it's gone through quite a bit of flight testing and so forth. That, they haven't cleaned it either. That's just how clean this engine is burning. That it doesn't even have a muffler and the noise is unique but not overwhelming. That's an interesting thing. Mufflers add a lot of weight. This doesn't even have one. So the breeze and, and with the three blade prop again gives us that same smoothness that we see so often in the LSA. So breeze uh, like this, the engine alone is about $20,000. With turbo equipment, that's not unusual. The Rotax 914 turbo is, uh, I think, about $30,000. So this is considerably less. It's less horsepower, too. But it's just the kind of engine that a light aircraft really loves. They are going to use this exact same engine on a breeze, too, that we'll see at Sun and Fun. Uh, owner Paul Mather says, the owner of uh, M-squared aircraft. So, now we're looking at an airplane that is, is conventional in a lot of ways. It's a tricycle gear airplane. It sits on its tail because the engine is aft of the CG. When the pilot gets in it, it goes down and sits on the nose wheel just fine. But if your camera can come down here, you'll see they've also got a little tail wheel on it. Now the tail wheel, honestly, is more for maneuvering around. If this was a hard surface, I could move this back and forth easily. Here's another little detail on the tailplane. As we come back here, there's normally a gap here. You can see this gap. Well, air can bleed through that gap, and when air bleeds through a gap like that, it affects the efficiency of the overall surface. So what they've done here with a little piece of rubber is they've closed that gap off. It doesn't interfere with the move movement. I don't want to move it too far because I think they've got it secured, but as the air cannot bleed through here, it makes this whole surface just that much more efficient. So engine at about 20 grand, airframe at about 12 grand, parachute at about five grand, and now let's go back and you're going to have to, we have to figure out how to get the camera in there to look at his instrument panel, but you got to see the instrument panel on this, this airplane. Put it all together, this is a little over 40 grand. You hear this is the aircraft. Think about it though, while that may sound like a lot for an ultralight, that's one of the most inexpensive LSA you can buy. And this is going to be a performer with all the bells and whistles on it. Let's go have a look at that panel now. So, we looked at the pedo tube on this, so we know that there's something inside this box that we want to see. But this is an ultra cockpit airplane. When it sits out in the airfield, they've got it nicely closed up here on this end number so that the instrumentation that's inside is protected from the elements. Now look at this. This you don't see on your typical ultralight. Here we've got the two Dynon uh, digital instruments, uh, the D10 series. Uh, they do engine instruments and they do some flight instruments as well, but you've also got the Garmin 496 or you could put the new Era in there, and I won't do this either, but this little button here on the Air Gizmo dock, the dock stays in the airplane, push that, this all pops out, you again can you take it into your motel room or the FBO or whatever and program your next bit of flight outside of the airplane in comfort. All the switches and whatnot, and all of this, if, my, if I was seated in the seat, my head would be about here. So I'd be seeing out easily underneath it, just lift my eyes a little bit, and I got all the instruments in the world, including an ICOM radio and a series of switches and circuit breakers. I think they've done quite a remarkable job with this. We've seen this kind of airplane for many, many years, but we haven't ever seen it done this way, and we've certainly never seen one with the HKS 80 horsepower turbocharged, twin turbocharged engine. Now, Dan, if I was doing this interview 30 years ago, I would be interviewing the two of you.
<laughs> you yeah. would be. Well, gee, do we go back that far, my gosh, Paul? We're not getting old. We're just getting better. At least that's right. the line. That's Welcome cool. to Paul Mather, the proprietor of M-squared Aircraft, one of our storied models in the light sport aircraft segment and in the ultralight segment before we got the light sport. Paul and I go back more years than we care to count. He was with another company for many, many years, cut his teeth in that company, learned a lot about it, and then went and did his own thing. How long ago? When did you start M-squared? M-squared is, uh, this is the 17th year that we've had M-squared, and uh, we've been building uh, the light sports pretty much from the beginning because they weren't called light sports back then, but uh, we were building to the primary category, and then that evolved right into the light sport. That's right. Another system that remains in place, primary right. category, and Rec Pilot, which was its sort of accompaniment, they, that never went very far for a variety of reasons. Light Sport came along, did much better, and so Paul is one of our stalwarts in the business. This airplane here is his creation along with his builder. Uh, Paul does other things, and I've said that you're going to have your Breeze 2 at Senate Fund, so yes, hope you'll have it there. Yeah, we'll yeah. have a Breeze 2 turbocharged there. We certainly want to go flying in that. We'll do some more reporting then. But for now, this is not the only thing you do in aviation, though, as if building airplanes wasn't enough. You do some other stuff. Tell us that. Yes, we do. Uh, I'm a DAR for the uh, Birmingham FISDO, and uh, I've got the uh, function codes for amateur built experimental, for the certified light sports, and for the experimental light sports. So if anybody's in need of certification standards or information, they can contact me right on the website. I've got a button on the website. Now certification codes is some of that FAA speak for meaning he's allowed to do stuff. Right. And in those categories, he said. Uh, but uh, you are, I think uh, they have all of you DAR sort of confined to certain regions, don't they? Yes, yes. In the Birmingham FISDO, I'm Alabama, Northwest Florida. Basically anything from Jackson, Mississippi to Jacksonville, Florida down to the Gulf Coast. So you'll go out, so a typical how that might work is somebody says, well, I just bought a new SLSA and I don't have a certificate for it yet. I paid for it. I got N numbers, but I can't fly it yet. So you've got to have somebody like you. DAR is Designated Airworthiness Representative. It's a civilian job, but with training directly from FAA, which has to be uh, redone periodically. That's How often correct. do you have to go re-school? We have to uh, re-school every two years and re-certify every three. So you got to keep proving your stuff time and time again. And if you go out and hand out some easy passes and say, "Wow, well, you know, I know you for a long time. I'm just going to write it up." What happens? No, you don't. You can't do that. <laughs> uh, we have uh, criteria that we have to certify by, and it's a checklist, and uh, we turn out. The uh, paperwork to, with every airplane to the FISDO, and I have what's called an air safety investigator who is my boss, and he looks over every P document that I submit to make sure it's correct. So I went, I went and visited Paul at his place down there in Alabama, and he showed me file cabinet after file cabinet. I forgot how many there were. There's got to be a dozen in there at least. Yeah. All four drawer file cabinets. We're talking a lot of paperwork here, but FAA thrives on paperwork, and Paul produces yeah. it. Evidently, to the style they like, because you kept that you've kept that DAR designation. Yep. Some others have lost it when they didn't right. stick with the rules tightly, and they are strict about it. I know. And we so good job, and thanks for that service to the community as well. Now, of course, it's a fee service. Paul does earn money, deservedly so, but it's still a little bit of a labor of love, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, you've got to travel around. Not always convenient to you. Hey, I got to have my airplane approved now, as soon as you can. Right. And and uh, people, I'm sure, have come to very much appreciate Paul Mather from M Squared Aircraft. How do we find out more about you? All right. The uh, website is msquaredaircraft.com, and uh, to get directly involved with me is paul at msquaredaircraft.com. Now, that's and m squared with your shirt says with a dash. Is it with or without the dash? All the one word. Just a word. M S Q U A R E D A I R C R A F T. M squared aircraft. And if you follow all that, you're a good speller. So there you go. Good job, Paul. Thank and you very much. Any additional questions? Have you any information on any of Paul's airplanes on your you side? Know, that's a good question. Let me think. Yes, I do. Yes, I think do. every one is. Yes, you do. Well, not this one. Not this well, one. But we're going to get to this one. But all the other standards. All the other ones I think we've got. I've flown them several times. They're just a joy to fly. I love this kind of flying. I'm so glad Paul's still doing this. That's all available on bydanjohnson.com or bydanjohnson.com. And this and many other videos are available on aircraftreporters.tv.